Good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to this general government committee meeting. Uh, and may we have a roll call, please. Councilmember Dennehy? Here. Councilmember Reed? Absent. Councilmember Schmisher? Here. Councilmember B. Smith? Uh, here. Councilmember Stein? Here. Councilmember Tracy? Here. Mayor Pro Tim Hamrick? Here. Mayor Smith? Um, and so this evening we're going to be hearing from the uh, Chamber of Commerce and also considering um, a chronic nuisance um, ordinance information. Um, and with that, Ryan, are you, do I turn it over to you or? Uh, we have uh, Rich Millard uh, from the Chamber of Commerce to give a presentation and so I'll just turn it straight over to Rich. Yep. Green go. is good. Okay. Green is good. Awesome. Well, it's my pleasure. I know most of everybody in this room, but it is my pleasure to be here to, to chat with you. Uh, the board president is sitting here behind me, uh, Cooper Trahern of our uh, now Royal Gorge Chamber Alliance, which we uh, became in uh, January of this year. And we're very excited to share, um, share our uh, road to this point from last September when I was hired as the executive director and uh, this is a, a little slideshow I had fun putting together and it's going to I'm going to skip over quite a few of the slides but it's just going to give you an idea of all the initiatives that we have underway and where we're going and where we've come from and so really excited to share this with you the the purpose of this is we do have some thoughts and ideas on our uh, tourism contract which we've done every year for the city basically operating the um, the tourism cabin of late, uh, in addition to our, um, our office downtown, which obviously used to be at the mansion as well. But um, going forward, uh, we have some thoughts and ideas on, on how to make this uh, a little bit more streamlined and, and hopefully a better experience for um, tourism in the Royal Gorge region. So uh, the Royal Gorge Chamber Alliance, as I mentioned, came into being uh, as in January. We are actually a DBA of the Canyon City Chamber of Commerce, which we didn't really want to lose the history. Been around since 1935, so um, a historical organization. And when I first um, was hired by the chamber, we, um, we needed to do a lot of uh, soul searching in terms of what, what is the value of a Chamber of Commerce in this day and age. And clicker. There we go. So the first thing we wanted to do is just kind of look back and look at the value of what is a Chamber of Commerce. And uh, some of this information came from the Association of Colorado Chambers of Commerce, which I'll touch on in the next slide. But the value of a chamber is obviously we support businesses. And when, um, when a chamber is successful, the businesses in the region are successful. And currently, just some interesting facts here, the Chambers of Commerce across Colorado represent more than 50,000 businesses and over a million employees. So uh, it's, Chambers are still a very uh, vibrant part of our community and we needed to look and see how we could be more a part of that uh, here in, in the county and the Royal Gorge region. So one of the first things, uh, not coming from a chamber background myself, that I wanted to do is get out and see what is the best of the best in terms of chambers of commerce and what they're doing around the state and around the country. Uh, one of the best things, best ways to accomplish that was joining the Association of Colorado Chambers of Commerce. Fortunately, they had their annual convention in October, just after I started here in Canyon City. So I was able to attend that convention in Fort Collins and connect with uh, 30 
over 30 Chamber of Commerce executive directors and presidents and other staff from around the state. Um, this is a great association. They are really, really heavy with um, executive mentoring and peer networking. Uh, a lot of legislative access is available through them and professional development. Some additional organizations that we will be joining um, throughout the year include the Colorado Chamber of Commerce, which has been around since 1965, and that's another direct uh, relationship with the state capitol and what's going on in the legislative bodies of Colorado, and also the Western Association of Chamber Executives, which is basically an academy for chamber executives, and they do a lot of really interesting um, networking and uh, classroom exercises throughout the year, which will um, definitely benefit us as I get to go to those and experience, and experience that education. Um, one of the things that we realized really quickly that we needed to do going forward is reaffirm our commitment to engaging with our, um, with our entities here in Fremont County. And that, of course, includes the city, uh, the county, Fremont County. And as our mission has now expanded to be a regional chamber alliance, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, also, our, the other cities in the county, including Florence and Penrose, also the FEDC, and our partner with, with the FCTC, of, uh, known as the Royal Gorge Region. So one of the first things that we really needed to do to get this underway was engage in a comprehensive strategic plan. And so in order for us to do this correctly, uh, we did hire a, uh, we hired Dot Miller, who was a former executive of the Association of Colorado Chambers of Commerce. And she came down and spent the best part of a day with uh, myself and our board of directors. And we won't go through um, exactly the content. I think I had copies printed out that everybody can, um, can examine a little bit closer at your leisure. But obviously we went through um, a SWOT analysis and really came up with what's gonna guide us in, through the next five years. Uh, one of the really interesting things that we um, uh, decided to adapt that is kind of the state of the art in the chamber world is most chambers of past were what they called a 3P chamber, which was parties, parades, and pageants. <laughs> and so kind of adopting the, um, what communities need right now is the um, three C's, and that's being a catalyst for business growth, a convener of influence and leaders, and obviously a champion for a strong and vital community. So in the chamber world, um, being a three, C, a three C chamber is a pretty big deal, and we decided that that was really one of our strongest paths forward to be con a strong contributor to Fremont County. And again, um, you can study a lot of this at your, at your leisure, but this was a lot of our sessions that we went through with our strategic plan and kind of developing our path forward through SMART goals and um, goals and strategies to get accomplished what we needed to do to um, take our chamber to the next level. But as part of deciding to become a regional chamber, uh, we also realized that it's not just about us, it's about the entire region. And so it really does take a bunch of villages to accomplish what we, what, we wanna, what we wanna do here. And so we've been actively engaged with the chambers, both in Florence and in Penrose. Penrose has been more conversation so far. It's uh, been a little difficult to get a lot of people together, but we have definitely reached an agreement that if we work closer together, and really pull our resources that we are going to be able to get a lot more done for our community uh, together as, as an entity. And that doesn't necessarily mean that Florence and Penrose lose their chambers. Uh, some models around the country have actually combined chambers into one entity. So what we more proposed, Florence I know was really concerned because they also have a very historic chamber that predates ours even back to the early 1900s is allowing these um, chambers to keep their identity, but to, um, to work with the Alliance to accomplish our goals. And so we kind of together are creating a roadmap as to what our partnership would exactly look like with these other chambers. 
and we have a lot of ideas and a lot of excitement around what we can do together. Um, and these are just some of the points that we have, have been discussed. Some of the things that are happening for sure, uh, once we adopt our new branding, which will be coming soon, um, obviously a refreshed website, uh, much more modern and streamlined and uh, a lot more user friendly and other technologies. We use a kind of a standard Chamber of Commerce uh, platform called Chamber Master and we've upgraded to a, a, a new and higher version of that and there are so many um, opportunities for us to, to really uh, use technology to help our businesses in the region. So we're really excited about launching all of that next month. <clears throat> One of the best things that we decided to uh, undertake though is completely redoing our membership structure. Uh, in history, most chambers have been working off of what they call the fair share business model, which is basically how many full-time equivalent employees a business have, and that basically, depending on whatever you have, is, is, is what determines your rate. And so in this day and age, that has been determined that that is not the most effective way to help businesses. And so the new wave kind of that swept over the country in the last decade is a, a tiered membership structure. And so again, we wanted to do this to the highest level possible by bringing in another professional in the industry. In this case, it was a lady named Kathy Height who um, had uh, run some chambers along the Front Range of Colorado, including Boulder, and she now operates her own uh, consulting agency out of Austin, Texas and was recommended to me by um, several chambers here in Colorado that she helped through the same process. And so we started back in November uh, with this and we had a community meeting and I know some of you uh, were, um, were able to be a part of that. And basically in, including, uh, I think that's Tashmar here behind me. And it was just great to have input from our m business members. Some of them have been members of the chamber for decades to hear really what they need and want from a, a Chamber of Commerce for them to be successful. And so we had that first meeting in, um, in November. And out of that, over the period of the months that have ensued, we have come up with this six-tier, um, basically, membership structure that in, on the surface, it looks really complicated, but it actually is very simple in terms of we now, any business, no matter what their size, can basically choose a menu of services that best apply to what they want to keep their business successful and growing. And they're no longer locked into, if you're a 500 member business, you have to pay this. If you're a two member business, you have to pay this. And so, um, we are really excited. This is basically being done across the country with extremely high results in terms of what businesses get out of this. And um, it starts with a lot of the um, same benefits. Every tier has kind of a base level of benefits. And then as you move up the tiers, there are a lot of, of opportunities. Some of the businesses now can actually predetermine a whole year's worth of, of um, recognition or um, advertising sponsorship of our of community events and we can apply those and come up with a customized plan for them throughout the whole year so they don't get constantly um, asked over and over again would you like to would you like to sponsor this would you like to sponsor that and so what we've learned is a lot of businesses really prefer this method where they can do it all at once, and then the chamber kind of administers that for them and helps them through the year. Uh, but moving on to obviously, like a lot of chambers in smaller areas, especially in tourism related areas like we are, uh, chambers of commerce take on kind of that second hat of not just uh, working with businesses, but supporting the tourism economy. And that's no different than, um, than what we do have done here in Fremont County. But we don't, um, our responsibility with the FCTC and the city of Canyon City to promote tourism, um, we don't take that lightly. And 
we, we really love the fact that we get to um, engage the visitors here in the Royal Gorge region in, in that facet as well as our, as our regular business members. And as we know, most all tourism trickles down in one shape or form to most all businesses that are operating here, whether they're actually directly related to tourism or not. And back in, um, back in November, uh, we were able to participate in a Colorado Tourism Office workshop that was sponsored through the FCTC. And one of the more interesting um, pieces of information that, that we went through on this was just showing how important that tourism is in, in our region. And, and even in the face of this pandemic that we went through, um, I found this stat re these stats really interesting from 2019 to 2020, uh, specifically here in Fremont County, how the travel spending and employment relating to tourism and the state and local tax revenue, we actually increased, which was completely opposite of most all other areas throughout the state and even the country. Another big reason that um, we really like the idea of adapting the Royal Gorge Chamber Alliance as our brand is that our name is now synonymous with a more recognized region. And it was interesting when I was up in Fort Collins at the, uh, at the Association of Colorado Chambers of Commerce um, back, in, back in October and was meeting all these other chamber directors from Colorado and I was introducing myself as from the Canyon City of Chamber of Commerce. Uh, one of them looked at me and said, is that near Grand Junction? Uh, so even within the state of Colorado and, and as plugged in as we would think Chamber of Commerce directors and presidents would be, there was still kind of a, a recognition issue with like, where's Canyon City? Um, so, and I would say, oh, it's, well, it's right next to Royal Gorge and then, oh, okay then they knew exactly where that was. So one of the, um, one of the benefits of this new brand is it, it gives us a little bit more power and a voice. And so when I'm now starting to engage uh, larger entities along the front range that have kind of direct correlations and relationships to us here, such as uh, visit Colorado Springs and even the Pikes Peak region attractions, and all, also the state tourism office, um, being the Royal Gorge Chamber Alliance really gives us a stronger presence with those entities. And it's been really exciting when I attended the governor's conference back in November that was happened to be in Pueblo this year, um, instantly recognizable. But we also realized that it's really the quality um, that drives the experience. And so what another thing that we are really interested in is studying the innovative strategies that we, that we can as a tourism champion, um, we can engage in to make our visitor experience a lot better here in our area. Um, one of the small things that we're going through right now, just as an example, is the State Tourism Office does a really um, nice concierge program. It's all online through, um, through videos and, and online courses. So. Uh, if we get 75% of our office staff and the volunteers that we will engage to go through and pass this program, then we will be a um, gold level certified Colorado concierge. And that just means that we're gonna be giving high quality consistent information to all the visitors that come through our office. And so um, we will have that completely done by the time our tourist season rolls around and very excited about that as well. Which kind of brings us back to um, the reason that I'm kind of giving you all this background is our contract with the city of Canyon City. Uh, as most of you know that uh, 27 years now we have, or 27 plus years, we've been contracted to perform an array of services for the city. Um, a significant part of this is basically our staffing and operations of a visitor center, which most recently has been down at the um, what everybody calls the tourism cabin in, in Veterans Park. And so the city for at least the last couple of years and, and including this coming year has allotted $31,000 in the budget for us to operate this cabin. And uh, last year it actually cost us $47,000 to operate the visitor center. So that kind of left us with a, a deficit of operating. 
and we got to looking closer at the experience of the visitor's cabin and just thinking about how we could do it differently and provide a better experience for our visitors here in the Royal Gorge region. It does present a lot of challenges, um, especially in the past few years. We've noticed, uh, everybody's noted how hard it is to not only hire and train uh, paid workers, but volunteers is a whole nother level. And so it is volunteer staff, and of course I came on into the chamber right as operations were winding down over uh, Labor Day weekend last year. Uh, but the staff uh, reported that the volunteer staff was extremely hard to come by to operate the cabin. And we have some great volunteers that work down there or that volunteer their time down there and we definitely hope to retain them. But to staff that cabin seven days a week, um, basically they had to resort to uh, uh, paid staff on to get anybody to uh, to work over the weekends and then anytime there was a no-show um, of course uh, a member of our chamber staff at our office would have to remove themselves from their duties and go down there and and staff the visitors cabin as well and so the logistics itself um, we have our downtown chamber office, which is <coughs> not too far from where the visitor's cabin currently, currently is located. So two, two visitor's centers that are really close to each other. Um, and we have the volunteers down there that are doing a good job, uh, for the most part, you know, giving information to our visitors. But what I was told is a lot of times, if they didn't have exactly the literature that they needed down there, that they would then come up to the chamber office downtown to get it up there. So in essence, we are making them kind of do a double stop. And the other issue was that the volunteers that were working down there really didn't feel all that safe working by themselves. And we technically didn't need more than one volunteer to do the duties of the visitor's cabin, but we were having to schedule them in twos um, just because they, they did not feel safe with kind of the constant flow of the transient population down there. And they even kept a police log of all the times that the police had to be called when, when uh, something came up and, and they didn't feel safe or they didn't feel like it was an appropriate thing for our uh, visitors to be seeing or watching. And that uh, police log was, was quite extensive. And then also just the constant um, trading of stock back and forth, uh, maps, brochures, and other collateral between the two offices takes a lot of time and energy. The cabin itself is um, not in the best of shape and really would take quite a bit of, of funds to get it to a state that I would at least consider presentable and something that we could be proud of to our visitors coming to the area as well. And I know um, according to our staff, we've paid quite a sum of money over the past years to, um, for example, replace the floor which um, the contractor found was a direct result of the park sprinkler system, um, kind of keeping constant moisture and water on it and a lot of other issues. So I guess overall we feel like the cabin is doing more of a disservice uh, to appropriately represent the attractions and activities and businesses of our, of our region. <clears throat> So what really got me to thinking about, you know, well, what, how, can we, how can we kind of work on this situation and what can we do going forward? So I turned to, of course, a town that I spent 25 years in that I think did an amazing job at creating a downtown visitor center. Uh, and this was in, is, is in Durango. And I had a chance to, um, to visit their chamber and their executive director. Now, this isn't a part of their chamber down there. It's kind of a another association, but it does work in tandem with the chamber. And it is right in downtown historic Durango. And it's, in a st and it's in a big storefront. It's about double the size of what our office is, but it is just full of really, really engaging um, displays, maps. Um, they have a small little gift area. And in fact, I couldn't get really good photos while they were open because it was just, there were so many people in there, so I asked if I could come in one morning early before they opened their doors so I could get a bunch of good photos without a lot of people in it. 
And so we kind of consider that we're in kind of a transition and uh, kind of Ryan had mentioned this in our discussions. And what we would really like to propose for this coming year for the $31,000 contract that we would like to um, we would like to get signed and get going is that we basically combine our visitor services at our current downtown location in uh, at 424 Main Street. And I've looked at quite a bit of our office and we can reconfigure to create a nice um, tourism counter at the front. And we have all the resources available right there. And we can still engage volunteers to work the tourism counter, but if we have issues staffing that, then our staff that's trained and well-versed in tourism is, is right there, like we are basically year-round. Um, but most of all, it really gets our visitors into the place where we want them the most, which is in downtown Canyon City. And that is, since I've started working, that is really one of the interesting comments that we get from almost everybody that comes in our office that's a visitor to the area, especially if they've never been here before, is mentioning almost right away is like, wow, what an amazing downtown you have. And so I really think it's to our benefit to get our visitors over on the um, downtown side of, of Royal Gorge Boulevard instead of across and cross the way in a, in a park. The other thing that we would be able to do with um, better con kind of con conglomeration of our volunteers is something else, Durango, and a lot of other, you may have seen it in a lot of ski areas around the, um, around the state, is they have these volunteer ambassadors that are mobile. And so they walk around downtown in an identifiable vest or some kind of a t-shirt or, or polo shirt or recognizable uniform to where they're actually able to engage our visitors um, face to face. And so if we didn't have to staff or schedule two volunteers at a time at the visitor's cabin, we could have one at our downtown office and then we would, I would love to do a program to where we could deploy a mobile ambassador and, and have them you know, kind of walk in the streets of downtown Canyon City and, and really engaging our visitors in what I think is a, is a more meaningful way. And of course, that's kind of a short-term solution. Uh, a longer-term solution that we've kind of been studying is, you know, what infrastructure do we have in place currently that, that we could use uh, in the next three to five years, or even closer than three to five years, but up to the next five years. And we, we did, um, through just my kind of looking up and down the street, uh, notice this uh, the building right across basically the street here from from City Hall, which is the old Canyon Floral Shop, which is actually owned by Beth and, and Colby Ketchmar. And when I, and they were, um, Colby was um, nice enough to give me a tour of the inside. And I was really kind of blown away, at least on the floral shop side, and how almost ready it is right now to become an instant visitor center as it is. And so, um, and again, I won't go in detail through these slides as you have them, but that would be a really interesting short-term solution that would be uh, worth looking into with partnership with the city and the FCTC. The building is large enough to not only house a really nice regional visitor center, but also um, we could have our chamber offices right there adjacent. So it still gives us the advantage of being right there, having the quality control over the volunteers, making sure information is being dispersed in a in a high quality fashion. Um, plus it's just at a perfect location in my mind. It's very visible from Highway 50 and it anchors the west end of the downtown historic district. Uh, you couldn't, almost couldn't ask for a better location. And as I said, the building itself, if no one's really kind of taken a minute to peek even through the front windows. Um, it's got a beautiful wood interior, uh, tongue and groove wood. <coughs> It's got information, well, counters that were obviously used for the floral shop, but could basically become information counters as they, as they stand. Oops. Um, just a really high quality area that could have all kinds of really interesting and engaging displays. 
I haven't pointed out that map in Durango that everybody used, a big, large map for a floor map for people to stand and look at, and look at the whole area. And I even um, went to the pains with the architect in me of uh, kind of sketching out what the floor plan could look like with kind of the visitor center side on the left and the chamber of commerce side on the right. Um, there is even uh, a, a greenhouse attached to the back of it that over time could be turned into a really interesting uh, events area. Um, I've been to several uh, weddings in, inside uh, greenhouses myself and, and they're actually quite wonderful. And upstairs, um, really, in, really interesting spaces with vaulted ceilings that could uh, provide services that uh, a lot of Chamber of Commerces um, have and should have, which is uh, meeting room spaces. And this is um, this is a photo of the um, of the one greenhouse attached to the back side, and and kind of a sample photo to the right of of what events and things could look like. In, in a space such as that. But it would, um, it would really be, I think it would be such an amazing addition to, to our town and our city and what we would have to offer for the whole region. So this is kind of the last slide. Um, you know, there's just a lot going on and we are so excited to be a part of the transformation and, and looking forward to um, and looking forward to the future and continuing our partnership with the city and, um, and the county in, in our services <coughs> and what we do and provide. Thank you, Rich. They just, so, um, <coughs> city council members, do you have any questions, comments, anything you'd like to ask or say to Rich? Yes. Thanks. Um, thanks, Rich. It, this is really helpful to see and hear. Uh, I doubt that I'm the only person who starts thinking about parking, <laughs> and no doubt you have too. Um, I wonder, I mean, obviously visibility is one thing, and I do think there's the potential for that property at the west end of Maine to really even be more visible than it is now. Uh, but I wonder, just under the current circumstances, are there people traveling in larger vehicles like RVs or pulling a trailer who are more likely to stop at the cabin now than they would be to go to Main Street and try to find parking, which as far as I know, there really isn't parking for RVs. And there's so many people traveling that way now. I just, I guess if you proceed in this direction, or we, whoever, mm -hmm. we have to really consider how would we solve that problem. So I didn't know if you had thoughts on that. Yeah, I know parking is definitely the one more disadvantage of, of downtown. And one thing I did think of in terms of parking in general, and I didn't know the steps that would be required to go through, is that at least from Labor Day weekend, or Memorial Day weekend through Labor Day weekend, I didn't know if it would be possible to you know, maybe put sign and dedicate a couple spaces right in front of the chamber office as, um, you know, visitor parking uh, to visit to visit the chamber office. Not that every single person is going to uh, abide by that, but, you know, it, it is right <coughs> in front of our office and we can keep an eye on it so that at least we can, um, you know, more easily accommodate um, people in, in vehicles. But and then larger vehicles. Yeah, the larger vehicles it would be would be the bigger issue on yeah. that. That's just sort of something I think. Yeah, as a community, we've got to figure that out. I just, and maybe I'm more tuned into it now that I drive a small RV myself for mm -hmm. the past year, year and a half. Well, that's that there's got to be a lot of people going through town <coughs> that can't stop because they don't know where they can park yeah. their RV. And that's one um, opportunity that the um, the floral shop location would really be beneficial to is there is a lot of opportunities to incorporate parking down in that area um, and even for now in the old Constantino's lot until something's done with it um, really easy to pull in and out of down there so if I could just interject really quick because it's on this topic 
because I was able to tour the building with a couple of other people from the CTC as well. And I noticed on your plans that it didn't include but having that outdoor restrooms or public restrooms because there is potential for not only just parking at that location for RVs, but for tour buses to stop. Yeah. And they love to stop at a place that has some really good public facilities exactly. for them. And, and that, that was another that really was another topic of conversation. And obviously I talked to Colby about it. <clears throat> he identified um, a place within the building that he had actually thought about, you know, putting a restroom or two. It's not anything in terms of like you know, large restrooms with multiple right. stalls, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it definitely would, it would get the ball rolling. And then, you know, if we were able to enter a, um, a longer term lease, you know, we could look at, at options and opportunities for that. Rich, that was a great presentation. I just have a question. Um, you know, th that is a, a nice building location in that but I'm wondering since you know we're looking at the regional how do the other places if we're going to try to bring the county together how do they feel about that being on Main Street rather than on Royal Gorge and spreading it out well, I, just a curiosity question on that or did, has that even been discussed that hasn't yet been discussed um, what we have discussed is obviously this is kind of a West End re, uh, visitor center and you know, down the road, uh, a, a big vision and goal would be to establish, you know, something on the east side of the county, um, possibly even in Penrose or something, you know, out in that area that our other chamber partners, you know, could could assist us with, because that makes an obvious uh, great place for people coming from the east side, from Pueblo, Colorado Springs. There's still such as Penrose are still at a place where they could go multiple different directions uh, off, off over to Florence or, or even to linger in Penrose a little longer and visit some of the cideries or, or whatever they had to offer there. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. So that, yeah, that is, that's kind of, you know, an additional down the road thought is to kind of bookend the, um, the county. Okay. With something kind of on the east side and, and then something cool. on the west. And then there's, there's other things that are kind of in the works. I'm a part of a working group that's looking at, you know, kind of when I say a three to five year plan for this current structure, um, I'm part of a working group that's looking into options for something that I'm sure you'll hear about sooner than later of possibility of doing a purpose built multi use building at the Constantinos uh, lot right. and making it, you know, even that much more grand. Um, as an entrance into the into the area and Amy of the I see your hand up we'll get to you in just a second so hang on but but please yeah, go can ahead I add w one thing to that um, which we haven't even discussed yet because this idea got floated this afternoon um, but with the new loves travel plaza going in um, if we could twist the city's arm to to um, work in the planning stages of that to potentially create space for the visitor cabin there or um, a visitor's desk um, with the amount of traffic that we assume is going in there would be a really good opportunity to have something on the east end of town. Yeah, so. that's something that somebody mentioned to me also um, when that kind of came out. And I've actually been to a lot of travel plazas in my, in my own travels where there's been a space carved out and it's not necessarily always a staffed space but a nice, a nice dedicated area with some really interesting engaging displays um, and then maybe you know if it wasn't even a staff space then directions to where people could go for more personal interaction but either direction either way that's that's another interesting east east end option that could be that could be explored Amy Thanks so much, Mayor Pratt. Um, Thanks so much for your presentation, Rich. Really appreciate it and really exciting to see your vision for, for the future of the chamber and kind of tourism in our town. I had a couple of questions about your annual annual report mm -hmm. so that I can understand how the visitor's cabin is currently used. I think according to our contract, it's supposed to be open year round, but I noticed in the annual report that it was closed January through April, and I wasn't sure if that was due to COVID. And then I also noticed that October through December, there were zero visitors. And I wasn't sure if it was open, but nobody came or if it had to be closed again. Thanks. 
So the cabin itself is only um, open from uh, Memorial Day to Labor Day weekend. And that's, that's the extent of its operations. The, the, um, the rest of the year, it is all through our main office. And I do, I do know that uh, I was told, and looking back during 2020, during the height of the um, onset of COVID, I, I do know that it was, it was closed for a majority of that, if not all of that, of that season yeah. in, in 2020. A majority of the volunteers that we have um, are, are elder, elderly at risk, people who did not feel comfortable throughout COVID yeah. and staffing it. So we had an even harder time in that period staffing the cabin. Okay, I guess I'm, I'm a little bit confused and I know Rich that this predates both of us, but in our contract it says that the scope of services, the chamber agrees that it will keep the visitor center open nine to four Monday to Friday year round. And then, ah, so the difference between the visitor center and the visitor cabin. Yes. Okay, yep. okay. So the visitor center is then just the, the main chamber offices. Correct, correct. Okay. Um, and you ha you haven't noticed kind of in that um, non-visitor cabin time period of the year any downside or any challenges with people just visiting the main chamber offices? No, we actually have quite a bit of traffic coming through the chamber, uh, the main chamber offices year round, and uh, it's, it's even throughout the winter. I think we even today we had uh, at least six or seven groups of people through uh, that were visitors to the area. That's fantastic to hear. Yeah. My one other question, um, and forgive my ignorance, but who actually owns the visitor's cabin? I was concerned to hear what, what you had mentioned about kind of the deterioration due to the sprinkler system. From, from my understanding, it's owned by the chamber. Yeah, the building itself, I, uh, from what I was told uh, in my term as, as president, that the chamber owns the physical building. Obviously, the city owns the, the ground that it's on. Um, and so we ended up having to do all the maintenance and floor repairs and everything out of the chamber's pocket, and that was included in last year's contract that we had discussed. Actually, thank you so much for those clarifications. Yeah, absolutely. So, so yes, ma'am. Oh, go? go ahead. Um, so if you were to move out of the cabin, do you have, have you thought of a plan as far as getting traffic from Highway 50, like directionally to Main Street? Well, it's now, not as visible from the Highway 50. I think that is, is a good point of discussion. I know even since the uh, new wayfaring signage has been up, there was really nothing um, allotted for the, uh, the visitor's cabin. And I was told by the volunteers that worked down there that especially since that happened, I guess there used to be a, before the new wayfaring sign, there was a, a more prominent sign down there. And they had noticed even with the loss of that, that it was, uh, people were having a lot of t uh, complicated time finding finding the location of where to go. Okay. Um, so we would definitely want to address, address the signage. Um, I'm not even, you know, we even talked about approaching the uh, owners of the, um, the uh, old, uh, of our old location at the mansion. I mean, the, <laughs> the digital sign there still says Chamber of Commerce, which we need to do something about because we, do have a lot of people that still go there. Yeah, because that was really visible. Yeah, and that's and that's really visible. But that's also like directly behind where our where our office is too. So and that parking lot that was used uh, by people when they were visiting that chamber of commerce also is available as well. So I think there are some opportunities to do some to do some signage that would properly direct people and maybe even incorporate it into the same uh, wayfaring style. That is um, that is currently there. Mm -hmm. Beth, did you have something to add? As long as you're, as long as it comes up on Google Maps, everybody will find it. Yeah. Right? Every person does now. If you just do Google Visitor mm -hmm. Center, and if, as long as it comes up on the Chamber on Main Street, it takes you right to there. And that's the way everybody does their directions now. Nobody, hardly anybody pays attention to anything else. Right? You know. So if you were to abandon the cabin as a visitor's cabin what mm -hmm. would happen to that cabin what well from my understanding there also used to be one uh quite a while ago on the east end of town kind of in where the k bobs uh in that area mm -hmm. and that was i guess sold yeah, um, yeah it was when the dinosaur was over there yep. and then they moved the dinosaur to pcc they sold that one to somebody mm -hmm. came and took it so 
Yeah. I would suggest for this year you put a sign up saying come over to the table. Yes. And then when people yep. in there, then they're directly over there. Oh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Our our thoughts were that um, I mean we could put a big banner on the front of it that says for information only please call um, if you'd like maps, <coughs> additional information or to discuss something with somebody and and meet somebody face to face please visit this address. As far as the cabin goes, we're open to ideas. Uh, we'd be willing to get it out of there and, and do something productive with it. Or if the city had an idea on a better use in its current location as a stopgap, we're open to input from, from council. Okay, and I, I actually really love the idea of the first street building for the, the, the new location for the chamber. I was wondering if you kind of had that, that dream timeline for there and any type of plan for financing it, because that is gonna take some substantial funds to make that a, come to fruition. Yeah, we um, haven't gone quite that far into it just because we didn't wanna spin our wheels and then have, you know, we wanted to kind of get consensus on the on the concept, you know, with, with our partners before we really got into the details. I know um, talking with, with Colby, he had some thoughts on what they would be willing to do as, an, as the owner of the building because they were already planning some upgrades and seeing how that would you know, tie in to, uh, to our use. And then um, you know, going out and, and looking for, um, for some funding sources to take on a, a project like that. Uh, it's a little more complicated, as Ryan pointed out, you know, that not owning the building, uh, getting some, some of the grants that we might mm-hmm. otherwise qualify for would, would require ownership. But you know, we would definitely look into all the options available. And initially when I looked at it, I was so excited about the floral shop side just being, like I mentioned, <laughs> almost ready to go that, you know, we could uh, even look at having something in there by, for this year. Uh, but that would kind of, you know, we would definitely have to find some additional funding because that would also, if we weren't able to move into the office side, that would kind of negate the main reason that we need to bring things together for this year, which is us being right there and, and having a hand in it. Um, so even though, you know, so I, I would think if, if uh, in a perfect situation, if, if, if all parties that were part of this could come to an agreement on, on the use of that building and get going on it, I would think we could definitely be ready for, for 2023. Yeah, it's kind of good timing. Um, we renewed our lease last year and we only renewed it for one year with the expectation that we were gonna move into something bigger and better. So um, at the end of this year, our lease is expiring. So we're definitely looking to make a move soon. Yeah. Okay. And, and that, that the building that we're in, the space that we're in now was really always just considered temporary anyway. It was a, it was a space that was open and, and available when the chamber sold the mansion and it works you know it's definitely not the most ideal space by any means um, but it definitely does work and we could definitely enhance it and make it work even better for a combined visitor center for for the season um, but it's definitely not a it's definitely not a long-term situation okay uh, and Beth if you have a comment please come up to the microphone so our people online can hear you I was just going to say when that uh, DOLA grants came up this last year, I had applied for a number of, of, of them, for, and that was one of the biggest ones that I had applied for was redoing the roof. And, and you know, because I think we envisioned redoing the roof, power washing the outside, restaining the outside, putting two windows with window boxes on the front part so for the upstairs. So it had more of a mountain cabin kind of appeal to it. Um, and yeah, yeah, and, windows, yeah. And so, um, and, you know, and the other thing that, um, well, anyway, th- so there, there was a lot of plans. We didn't get any of those grants, and nobody did, I guess. But there maybe will be more money, money coming up because I think it could be it could be conceived as a startup kind of a program for restarting uh, for COVID, coming back, you know, redoing a chamber, redoing a presence on that end. Um, so hopefully there might be something available that, you know, I could apply as a business owner for the grant on that side, for the outside, and then some money, other money for the inside. So that'd be. Okay. Amy, um, I love your kitty. That's so cute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we, we, we did, you know, kind of to backtrack just a little bit, um, 
uh, Chris Webb, you know, who's been the director for a long time and has just an immense amount of experience with that. We went through several scenarios with the budgeting, and you know we did determine that for the thirty-one thousand dollars that the city uh, has allotted for our contract for this year, that we could we could definitely operate the combined visitor center at our 424 main location for that amount of money for this year and not and not at a loss so we're, we're confident we're confident on that side of things so I guess I was gonna kind of maybe put you in the hot seat that I that each of us would probably be in is when our citizens say um, the visitor cabin is closed because that is a big change yeah. is closed and you're spending thirty-one thousand dollars. Well, what value are you giving mm -hmm. the are you giving the city because this is taxpayer money in exchange for the closure of that cabin? And so, how how would you answer that if you were in our seats? I would say that we're going to give them a much higher quality experience um, being downtown and in our office where we have uh, not only uh, you know volunteer staff but we have our our paid staff that um, is available and we have the resources centralized in one spot um, and then if I'm able to better utilize our volunteer resources because we don't have to schedule two at a time down there then I think more than anything the a downtown um, ambassador roving ambassador would just be so much better in terms of a way to engage people as they're out and about as well so I think on those three fronts it would be a pretty easy thing to show especially once we're able to really get in and reorganize um, our office itself too the and, uh, and, and and not not to mention really the one of the biggest factors is again getting people over to downtown to where they're they see what a great area it is, and they want to walk around and spend money in the shops and the restaurants down there, where otherwise, you know, you may, if they stopped at the visitor's cabin, you know, they may say, you know, head over there and take a look around, but you never know if they're actually going to get the experience of, of seeing it firsthand or, or following that advice. So I have uh, several questions and a couple of comments. The, is the, is the a cabin ADA accessible? Does it meet standards for ADA accessibility, do you know? I would have to measure the width of the door. I believe everything is at ground level there. Yep, yep. So it's all on grade, it's ADA accessible. Yeah. There's a ramp. There's there is a ramp. Yep. There's a yep. ramp up yes. to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and would anything need to be done to the flower shop to, to make that ADA accessible? No, the, the only level change in that shop, uh, well, I mean, there's an upstairs, obviously, and then there's a level change up to the right side that I kind of designated as potential chamber offices, but the main visitor center itself is all on one level. Okay. And it's the, actually the, got a, a wider double door. Yeah. Great. The biggest speed bump uh, with that would be ADA compliant restrooms. Yes, that, which, uh, that's always uh, a challenge. Colby had mentioned that he had already talked about putting them in, an, in a location there, so um, it's already kind of been in the work in the works. So. Okay, um, have you, Rich? Have you have you looked at the master plan that covers the Centennial Park and uh, you know the the current area where the cabin is right now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yes. Um, the. I just wanted uh, one comment I had is that is that I, I have been in the Durango um, Visitor Center and it, and it is quite attractive and as a matter of fact the next time I go back there I want to make sure I go back in there again yeah. because it is really such a great experience uh, and if we had something like that it would be just stupendous I think um, the part of what part of what the the future plans the the city is considering uh, is is something with Black Hills for the Clark Station property uh, and possibly turning that into some type of RV um, you know facility or something like that um, but it seems to me that if we're if we're just kind of brainstorming here one of the things that we could consider is um, with the appropriate signage so people know what's coming up because it always helps to know 
when you've got a big rig and you're driving it that, uh, that, that you may want to be in the right lane, the correct lane, but, uh, but, but maybe even turning that area into RV parking as it is. Uh, there, there'll be challenges there because uh, where the cabin currently sits uh, because of all the trees, uh, you know, and, but uh, that, that seems to me that if that was, if that was easy in, easy out RV parking, it would, it would really boost, uh, you know, the, a chamber location across the street as well as, uh, as Main Street there. You know what? I don't want to interrupt you, but I, have, yeah. I just had an idea because you mentioned the master plan for Centennial Park. It also includes a little kiosk for renting tubes and stuff to play on the river. And perhaps a cabin could be repurposed mm -hmm. for something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, also being involved with the old ice plant, uh, that idea has been kicked around um, later in life when, whenever we demo that building and move on. Um, yeah, but the cabin would be a great opportunity there. Okay. Any other questions, comments? I just, yeah, I just had something quick. Um, you'd mentioned something about uh, like information areas. I've just, just something to throw out there. QR codes are huge right now. Mm -hmm. I'm an old fuddy-duddy and I had no idea about these, but almost all my advertising for my business now is all linked to my QR codes that take you right to my website. And that yep. might be something for an unmanned kiosk or something. That's mm -hmm. a great idea. Yeah, Kevin yeah. Mamalji mm -hmm. came and gave a presentation mm -hmm. at the chamber about um, doing hiring with QR codes, which I had never heard of before. Um, but that is a great idea to do. Yeah, we put them on the city market carts, so you just go right to the website. That's it's super awesome. yeah. easy. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. They're using it a lot too. Um, something that we've been exploring with some other partners, like uh, kind of a heightened level of a downtown interactive downtown tour. Oh, that where would you be have cool. the, you know the, t the QR codes at the various buildings that you stop at, and then all those really nice written guides that we have could be, you know, updated and, and put in a more interactive way. So that would be amazing. Would, you know, it would work right along with that type of a, a situation for sure. Um, Andrea, um, we've kind of mentioned a couple of times, both on this side and on that side, about Constantinos. Is there something that the city has planned for Constantinos specifically that would preclude at least temporarily using that for RV and tour bus parking? I mean, That's there is a parking lot there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. this, that, there is, and, and the, the, challenge, the challenge for RV parking is that, is that you um, don't want to have people backing up, you know, if you can avoid it at right. all. And so you need to, there needs to be kind of a circulation Type thing that uh, that, that you, you can, can do to park, in but and out, and there's no way to reconfigure that lot to do that. Well, there's there's always a way. It's just a question <laughs> of how much it costs, you know. Ex exactly, um, but you know, maybe something temporary that that, that we could think about. Um, and then the other piece of the puzzle is some kind of on-demand shuttle. That we could get people from because if they're in an RV, are they going to be able to walk all the way downtown? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Maybe just There's have an on-demand thing like we have for our seniors. That you, it's a, an on-demand call, and mm -hmm. you know maybe we could just try it for a, like three to six months and see in the summer, because we have a lot of visitors in this town. We do, and that might be a conversation to have with the Golden Age Center. They right. do have quite a few vans, so. Yeah, they have the vans, and if they, you know, and, and depending on how busy they are, maybe they they could, you know, do that. But that's just the thought. But the Constantinos, I'm, I don't know that much about it. I apologize. But, you know, if there was some way to temporarily, you could just do it with paint, maybe. You know, uh, paint lines. Exactly. To do it cheap, so. Yep. That's on, yeah. Well, borrow the mm. uh, borrow the baseball fields. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the chalking. <laughs> the striper. The striper. Right. Bryant, you know how to use that, Brandon. <laughs> it's chalk, though. Yeah. It's not spray. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Any I'd also uh, I'd, I'd like to apologize to Emily and Andrea. I haven't had the opportunity, and I didn't introduce myself when I came up here. Um, I'm Cooper Trahern. Uh, it, I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you, but I wanted to mention that before we're done. So. <laughs> 
And as we're wrapping up, I just want to say that I am just really excited with the new leadership between Cooper and your board and your excellent hire with having Rich on board. I mean, I'm just really excited about the direction that the chamber is taking. It's, I mean, you're just going gung ho and you're, you're walking the talk and I'm, I'm really looking forward to all of these changes and it's really exciting. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I couldn't be happier with our decision to hire Rich. Things have been great. Um, I, I mean, he's been a great face of the chamber, really driving a lot of the strategy and initiatives that we talked about that were just big ideas. Um, Rich is, is putting those ideas to work and we're, we're excited about where we're at and where we're headed. So This is the best chamber presentation I have seen in my six-year career. Great. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you all for taking the opportunity to listen to us. Well, and, uh, more than anything, we want to be, you know, talking with Rick and, and Ryan too. We, we definitely want to be an organization that is known for, you know, if nothing else, being reliable and always there and supporting. And I know that in the past that has not always been the case, especially with the city and our partners. And that is really one of the main things that I wanted to, uh, I didn't want to come from a place of disparity with, a, you know, suggesting that we, you know, if, if some people look at it as a reduction in service, I really want to look to the future because uh, you know, I, I grew up in Colorado Springs and spent my childhood coming to the Royal Gorge to recreate with my family. And uh, this area is just, I don't have to, you know, sell it, but it's just incredible. And I want to, I want to change so that we, that all the visitors can see that in the same compelling manner and not have to go in this kind of dark, dingy, cramped little cabin to get their information. Um, you know, above everything. And this is just a really good time with all the initiatives that we have in place to go ahead and start making that, that change and steering in a little bit different direction. And will it be perfect uh, to start with? You know, probably not, but we have a vision and we know where we wanna go. And I'm sure with all the talent we have between our partners that we'll find a way to, to get there. Well, thank you, and also thank you because you have been an integral and incredibly important partner for the 150th celebrations for all of 2022, and the chamber has been really, really awesome to partner with the city, and we couldn't do it without you. It's been our pleasure. It's fun. Thank you. Thank you. We'd love to see you all. Um, our annual banquet is coming up in April. It's on the 22nd. Um, all of the information will be getting blasted out soon. We'd love to see everybody there. And don't you have business after hours this week? Too? Tomorrow yeah. it is at the Hive. At the Hive. Yep. Yep. Uh, before you move on, Mayor Pro Tem, I, I just want to make sure that we have a consensus from City Council to move forward with the contract without the visitor cabin. Yeah. Yep. All right. We will uh, we'll amend that contract and bring that back, uh, hopefully, at the next meeting. Okay. Thank, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And if you have, you know, you have the handout. So if you have any other questions or input or ideas, uh, I would, you know, love to hear from you because, you know, I want everybody has great ideas and I just I want to feel like you're all involved in this as much as as much as we are. So please reach out. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. And so now we'll move from our take our welcome hat off. <laughs> and put on our do we do have standards hat <laughs> i would love to get an introduction to i'm assuming this is one of our newer code enforcement employees this is cso supervisor wendy marcy i brought with me today so we, we watched footage from the last time we talked about this subject so she's got some answers for you tonight oh okay well thank you for being here and thank you for stepping into the role it's we're excited to have a full staff and see that things are rolling for code enforcement again. We so are excited. You. Yes, ma'am. She is. Uh, she has really uh, helped us lift the uh, lift the unit up. I think we're uh, night and day difference from where we were this time last year. Great. So please proceed. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead oh, and uh, yeah. kick, kick okay. us off here. Yeah. Uh, so we we had a vision meeting regarding this subject last year and. Uh, with some of the staffing changes this got put on the back burner um, 
And uh, you know, there, there were some requested changes. You have the red line copy, or it might be a blue line copy in, in your packet. Um, we wanted to, before we brought this straight to council for approval, because we have new council members on the dais, we wanted to make sure that we had a discussion about it before we did that. Uh, we also have Catherine Sellers, the city attorney online uh, on the Zoom call to, to answer questions. Um, Kat, Catherine, do you want to talk a little bit, you know, high level of, of overview of what this ordinance is and, and how it works? Sure. Um, so a few of you will remember um, our Title VIII um, complete rewrite. And this is a kind of a continuation of that. I, I, would, I would characterize it that way. And this is to address very specific nuisances that occur within the city. Um, they're not common necessarily, but we have had them over time. Um, and these are additional tools for code enforcement and the prosecutor to use to deal with these. These are particularly, I mean, the, the ordinance uses the term chronic nuisance, but these are particularly egregious situations that are often without improvement. And so the ordinance does a couple of things. So in section one, it sets a standard that um, no, so what happens in case you're not, those of you not familiar with code enforcement, typically there's a notice of violation and then there's a summons and complaint and the person goes to court and they have a hearing. Um, and typically we seek an abatement order, which allows us to go onto the property or and abate the nuisance and also orders the person to go ahead and abate the nuisance. So that's the general process. And so the first part of the ordinance really deals with situations where we don't even want to go, we want to skip the notice of violations um, period or even process. So, and that only happens when there's been three written notices to a property within 12 month period, or the owner's occupant is already subject to um, a deferred judgment agreement or a probation agreement, which means they've already been to court and they've gotten a judgment against them. And you know they've entered into an agreement to promise to stop doing something and they're doing it again or they're doing something new that's a violation and so we can skip the notice um, if we if we so choose now that's a may and not a shall so the code um, the s um, the, the community services officer can make the choice to to have an, a notice of violation in that section or under those circumstances um, section two really deals with those chronic nuisances and so that's you know, three um, or more occasions within a 60 year, day period or three or more notices and three or more notices have been issued in that 60 day period or that the nature of the activity is, is such a substantial threat to the neighboring properties that it rises to the level of a chronic nuisance. That's going to be a pretty high threshold. Um, I know that that's a, that language is broad, um, but it's going to be a pretty thre high threshold um, both Trisha, who's your prosecutor in our office, you know, we stay in pretty close contact, Trisha in particular with the um, code enforcement. And, you know, we talk through those things and whether or not something would be a chronic nuisance would, would be, you know, run by us first. So, and we have had situations where they have come very close to that standard. I think it, I watched the video from the last meeting too. And, uh, you know, we talked about, um, a property that's now cleaned up but when we first started in canyon um the person was taking was getting nearly expired meat from the grocery store and putting it outside in their backyard in the sun and like a lot of meat not just like one hamburger like packs and packs of meat and there was rat infestation and there was no plumbing in the house or there was no working water in the house no working plumbing no sanitation it was just a mess. So we have had occasions where where nuisances could rise to that level. Um, and then in addition, so subsection B there talks about the, the length of the notice for a chronic nuisance. So it's a lot shorter than the typical time period for um, a nuisance. The, the basic standard uh, is seven days. Uh, we often try to, you know, if someone's complying and they're working towards it, code enforcement, you know, that's judgment call, they will often extend it beyond that seven days um because it's a lot easier to get you know we all prefer voluntary compliance over taking someone to court um and so if we can get them to do that we we like that so we will 
you know, give them an opportunity. But seven days is generally the, the time frame which most notices have in them. And, and Wendy can talk a little bit more about that detail. Um, and then the last section here in C, subsection C is more about the municipal court process. It's subject to an expedited proceeding. Um, and then finally in section three, this is actually just a, um, a correction to the ordinance. This removes a protest process that um, frankly accidentally got left in there that shouldn't have been in there when it was first redone. And so that's, we're just removing that. So it's a little, that doesn't really have anything to do with the chronic nuisance. That's just a correction um, in, the, in the section. So um, I'm, I know that's a lot of information and then I'll stop talking and answer any questions. Thank you, Catherine. And I must make note of your new background there. I know you're not at the beach anymore. Yes. I'm trying to keep you on your toes, Mayor Pro Tem. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm somewhat of a beachcomber myself, so I'm a little bit heartbroken here. But anybody? Have any, <laughs> anybody? Maybe next time. You never know. <laughs> yes. Um, in the proposed changes on um, the first page, section one. Uh, the paragraph there, it starts with the number five. Does that paragraph need to specify that it's in regard to the same nuisance condition? It doesn't get that specific, and I just wondered if that's needed in case there's multiple things going on on a property. Um, actually, it's written that way on purpose, not to be um, okay. connected to the same nuisance because okay. um, a lot of times there's never one nuisance on a property right and if someone's already been to court they're already kind of aware of the nuisance procedure and the nuisance requirements and if they continue to violate not necessarily with the same nuisance we want to be able to go to summons and complaint without going to notice okay thanks so that's that's our that's a, my preference and the prosecutor's preference of course it's all it's ultimately up to you all got it thanks sure any other questions or comments? I do have one comment on, uh, on so on page two under um, B, uh, it basically says, uh, the sentence ends, unless three notices have been issued pursuant to section, and it, it makes a quote, pursuant to which no additional period of abatement, of abatement is authorized. And rather than pursuant, uh, maybe it should read in which case no additional period of abatement is authorized because you got kind sure. of have two pursuants there. <laughs> sure, we can change that. We can clean that up. I'd make it clearer to, to me the way I read things. Mm -hmm. So, Chief, you mentioned that you had what you guys had watched the vi previous video and have a lot of answers from last time and want to, you know, you've done your, you've done your homework. I want to make sure you have an opportunity to <coughs> present to council. Wendy did have some information okay. for you. Okay, thank Madam you, Mayor. Wendy. Okay, on the video, um, some of the questions that came up um, were how many properties um, would this have pertained to? Um, so I can only attest to the last six months um, because that's pretty much how long I've been here. Um, but just some basic numbers for you. And, and let me just um, real quickly explain our process to you. So my team always starts with a courtesy notice. Um, and that may be a verbal notice, that may be just be a knock on the door. You know, hey, we noticed that all of your trash is on your front porch. You know, is, is, do you have a plan for taking care of this? Um, we also have um, little door knockers for, for all of our most common notices. Um, so it al almost always starts with a courtesy notice. And Wendy's not gonna tell you that the number of voluntary compliance have risen dramatically since they're, they've started these processes. So I, I'm not a toot my own horn kind of person. That's so, why I'm here. <laughs> so we're at about 91, 92% voluntary compliance just on courtesy notices. So that's why we're maintaining that. And we also wanna maintain a customer service friendly presence. We don't wanna be those people that when we show up on their doorstep, they're like, oh God, what do they want? Um, or people hiding from us or anything like that. So we're trying to maintain that customer service friendly presence. So we always start with a courtesy notice. That courtesy notice gives people seven days to clear up their violation. Um, again, like Chief said, we're at about 91% um, compl voluntary compliance on just that alone. 
Um, if they don't clear up the violation within that seven days and they haven't contacted us to say, you know, hey, look, it snowed, I couldn't get this done, or, you know, I have COVID, I can't get this done, then we go to the notice of violation um, that Catherine is speaking of, and that gives them 10 days to clear up there. So basically we've given them now 17 days to get, get it fixed. Um, a lot of the properties we're dealing with, like the ones that this ordinance is kind of meant steered towards, are not 17-day projects. They're not 30-day projects. They're, they're month-long projects if it's a homeowner working on the issue. Um, and again, we, we're customer service friendly. So if we give them 10 days and we see consistent, you know, we check back in with them, we follow up with them, we drive by the property consistently after we've issued that notice. And if we see, you know, they're making progress, they've got a roll off dumpster, things are going well, but they're probably not gonna make that 10 day deadline. You know, we'll extend, we'll extend their deadline, but there has to be visual progress and good progress before we will do that. If they're just blowing us off, if they've only moved one thing in the yard or they've moved the junk refrigerator from the front yard to the backyard or um, something like that, then we'll move to the, the summons and complaint after the 10 day period. So that's kind of our process, um, just to give you an idea. And now I completely forgot where I was going. Oh, <laughs> um, so the properties um, that we've given more than one courtesy notice to in the last six months, so there's been 11. And that could be one verbal notice, one knock on the door, and then followed by a written notice. You know, hey, we checked back in, you haven't made any progress, this is your kind of last chance to do so. Um, properties that we've issued more than one notice of violation on has been three. Um, properties that I know of, and this is not in the last six months, but this is um, file folders that I found in my office, um, big file folders I found in my office, that have been abated by the city more than once. I know of personally two, um, but I know there's been more, and Ryan can probably, can probably speak to that. Um, and those have been very big, very expensive projects, and sadly some of those could be abated again pretty easily. So. Um, those are the properties that this ordinance um, is geared towards. And then we have some properties we're working with right now that we've identified that will potentially be properties that will have to be abated by the city, that either the landowners are not responsive to or we just know they're gonna be, you know, they might get it cleaned up this month, but next month we're gonna be back in the same boat. Um, and we have three of those that I, that I have my eye on right now that are potential to have the potential to be have to be abated by the city. And unfortunately, one of those that we're looking at is, a, is gonna be a very expensive abatement if we have to do it. So um, those are kind of the numbers that, that um, you guys were looking for in the last, in the last meeting. Um, I had a couple um, notes as far as like verbiage on the ordinance and they're kind of petty um, in the grand scheme of things, but I'm a clarity person. Be the, the clearer things are, the less explanation we have to do in the field. Um, it just makes our job easier. So Catherine, I can either send those to you or I can just bring them up now. Hey, send them to me. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. And then we also had a question about on the second page under C number two, those timelines um, 15 days and 30 days are probably not going to work on our municipal court dates because we don't always have we don't always get them to court even in 30 days after we issue those summons so we might have to look at something like the next available court date or or something like that okay we can talk about that because Trisha's reviewed that and she didn't have an issue with it okay. so yeah, right now, if I issued a summons, they wouldn't be in court till May, so. Okay, we can talk through how to handle that. Okay. Um, so that's all I really have comment-wise. Well, and I did touch base with Wendy uh, this morning after watching the videos. There were a couple other questions that council had um, brought forward, and uh, there was a question about uh, pre- and post-ordinance effect. Um, documentation of that so um, Wendy's doing an excellent job of uh, requiring efficiency reports on a weekly basis and producing those reports on a monthly basis um, so that's already in the works um, we can certainly handle that 
and give give council an idea of what what effect the, the ordinance has had um, and the photo evidence there were there was a comment um, or question concern about the photo evidence and uh, the city attorney addressed that it is in in the manual that they helped create and produce um, and that's a standard protocol that they follow uh, so that's that's a moot issue okay questions yes uh, yes uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether this has been addressed before we were on council but what about when there is a serious mental illness issue how do you address that how do you work with that on the look on your face it looks like you have when a few of those <laughs> yeah. uh, she's familiar <laughs> <laughs> Like, come on. Okay. Um, so unfortunately, a lot of the cases that we have are associated with uh, mental health issues, um, a lot of the hoarding situations. And we have a team of co-responders at the police department, um, Ansel Vista mental health people that uh, sometimes go with us and they work the mental health side of it while we work the code enforcement side of it. Uh, many times we work with a relative um, of that person to kind of help steer the the code side in the right direction um, but we do work really closely with the police department's uh, mental health team um, and Sol vista to make sure that those those needs are met um, and that's going in the right direction um, rather than just go in and say you know we're gonna we're gonna clean this up and put a lien on your property and we're sorry that you don't understand what's going on so so we, we take that team with us whenever we have that issue just to follow up on that, does Starpoint ever interject at any time? We don't. We don't really. Um, they haven't. Um, okay. But we haven't. We haven't had a case with one of their clients yet. I'm sure if we did, that that they would be. I just. I used involved. to rent to Starpoint um, clients, and they used to come in and like check the property and right. make sure that they were cleaning and make sure that they were tidying and. Um, showering and right. all those important things so and I that know. may be why we don't um, okay. don't have any of their properties that makes um, sense but if they did I'm sure that they would they would work really closely with us Amy did you have a comment yes thanks so much Mayor Pertem and thank you so much for that presentation Wendy it actually answered the majority of the questions that I had um, I did have a couple of additional ones though I was wondering um, does the police department think that this is a necessary ordinance? Do you, I mean, is this something that you feel like you need passed in order to, to be able to do your job? Do we need it to do our job? Not necessarily. Will it help us? Um, absolutely. Uh, we were, I was actually pretty excited to see when Ryan sent me this, um, that it was going through because when we do get to this point with some of these properties, we have to go back and start this whole process over again and then we're back out to the whole 30 45 days before we can do anything um, and and you know maybe they make an improvement maybe they they clean up the trash but that so they solve that violation but they don't fix the other violations and that keeps them out of court a lot of them know how to play the game um, so that keeps them out of court just this much longer and now we have to go back and start this over so yeah this is this will absolutely be a game changer for us Okay, thank you for that. Um, I was really excited to hear about the 91 to 92 percent um, voluntary compliance rate. That's that's really fantastic, and I think speaks uh, speaks volumes about what you and your team are accomplishing in the field. Um, I did have two specific questions about the bill itself. Um, one following up on Council Member uh, Tracy's comment on Section One, Number Five. I guess I'm a little concerned that that it is um, meant to address new violations um, or violations on a code that had not been previously uh, notified. Just because it doesn't doesn't seem like you're necessarily giving people fair warning before bringing them um, before issuing a summons. So I guess I'm, I'm wondering how often do we think that that would actually be the case and. Um, I'm interested to, to hear what other council members think about that as well, if other people have concerns about that. So when, when we write a notice of violation, uh, just like Catherine said, we rarely write a notice of violation for one, for one violation. Usually if there's a trash violation, there's also um, outdoor storage, which is junk in the yard, um, that kind of stuff. There's almost always weeds. Um, so all of those violations go on the notice of violation. 
So we have room, I mean, we can add as many violations to a single notice of violation as we want to. Um, so most likely all of those violations on the property have been addressed with that single notice of violation. So there mm -hmm. wouldn't really need to be, or there wouldn't be a reason to have to address those again, is kind of, I think is what Catherine is trying to say. Am I right, Catherine? You're on mute, Catherine. Wendy probably knows better than I do, but at least from my experience, it's always the same violations over and over again. Yes. They rarely pick up a different one. Um, I can't actually recall any at the moment that would have, that weren't the same ones over and over again, that they had started something new or anything like that. So um, probably, it probably wouldn't happen very often, to be honest, the, the circumstances where it would be something totally new that they were not previously aware of the law. If so, I mean, that, that being the case, I think personally, I would feel a lot more comfortable if we were more specific and said that it was about the same violation as opposed to being able to issue a summons on something that people hadn't been previously notified about. Especially if we don't think that, that it would happen very often anyway. And we can make that change if that's council's preference. Doesn't that bring you back though to having to start 45 day process all over again? I mean, it's, it's not really gonna affect us because um, just like Catherine said, it's, you know, we will, we will probably have addressed all the violations on the property on that single notice of violation. So if there's something new. Like um, if hamburger meat isn't yeah. on sale, now it's chicken. <laughs> right. If we issue a notice of violation on one, on one charge, it's generally weeds. Um, Otherwise, if it's trash, there's usually three or four other violations on the same property. So I, it's not gonna affect us in, in an adverse way, I don't think. Okay. And what do you talk about extensive Sorry. cleanups? And, oh, go ahead, Amy, you finish up. I just had one other one. Um, on A2 under um, 842.015 chronic nuisances, I know, Catherine, in your presentation, you had mentioned that this is really broad, um, but that it would always be coming to you and the prosecutor for review. I'm wondering if there's a way to um, to give Wendy and her team a little bit more specificity in the field um, so that they have the, you know, as she mentioned in her presentation, so that they have the, the data and the, the information that they need to be able to, to make those determinations. Obviously, it would still come to you guys for review, but is there a way to put a little bit more specificity in there? I'd rather not put it in the ordinance. I'd rather do it through training and working with code enforcement, which Trisha and I do. Um, and that that would be my preference in trying to do it. Trying to create the right language um, without leaving anything out is really challenging. And so it's really, you know, it would be a training issue um, between us and them is how I'd prefer to leave it. Yeah, and th there is a code enforcement manual for training. And I, I think that, uh, I would concur with Catherine that it's probably where that, uh, that type of information should live. Okay, thank you, I appreciate it. So Wendy, I, I was just curious if you could enlighten us a little bit more about some of these extensive cases that, I mean, that this chronic nuisance order would, will help you with. I, and, and I'm gonna jump in there real quick because I know of one and I, I smile at Ryan and it's one that you know that I drive by every day, and and so do a lot of my neighbors, and I and I'm the one that catches stuff for it, and it's the one there on, on Park, right at the bottom of Pump Hill. Um, I wasn't here when when that property was abated originally, um, but yeah, that I mean that's that's definitely one of the bigger cases that that they've done. Um, so yeah, it's it's properties like that. It's properties, you know, the properties we're working one right now. Um, that you know they don't get that, that way overnight. It's years and years and years of accumulation. It's usually, you know, hoarding situations and and not hoarding situations like you see on on TV, but just outdoor junk and tires and and stuff where you know mentally these people you know I'm going to use that someday. I'm going to use this someday. I'm going to use that someday. Um, and it's I mean it's it's a mental it's a mental issue where. You know, everything they have is, it has a purpose, it's, it's something good, but to the neighbors, it's, it's junk and trash. And when we go look at it, you know, it's like, 
it's, you know, it really is junk and trash, but mentally to them it's, it's not. So, but I mean, and some of it is, it's a case where like tires, it's really hard to get rid of tires these days. So instead of getting rid of them, they, they let them pile up in the backyard. Um, old vehicles, scrap is way down. It's not hardly worth taking one to the scrapyard right now. So they let them pile up in the backyard. It's, it's stuff like that where it just accumulates and accumulates and accumulates and eventually um, it just gets so big that when you go tell them, hey, you have seven days to clean this up or else, they look at it and go, you know, it took me 32 years to make this mess. <laughs> you want me to clean it up in seven days. So it's, it's stuff like that. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's a financial hardship issue. You know, maybe they're having to de decide between feeding the kids and paying the trash bill. Um, and we have some of those cases too. And that's one of the reasons that we, you know, maybe we did issue more than one courtesy notice because, you know, if it's between feeding the kids and paying the trash bill, I wanna work with you and, and get this done, you know, in 30 days instead of seven days or, or something to that effect. So um, it's, they're just big properties that have been you know, let go or stuff accumulated on or abandoned properties where homeless have, you know, moved in and moved out and left all the, all the stuff behind. It's, it's big properties like that. And I, I think that that's part of the importance for an ordinance like this. So Wendy's talking about the legacy of, of some of these properties where it's been years and years of accumulation. Whereas if you have an ordinance with, that addresses chronic nuisances, it gives code enforcement more, uh, another tool in the toolbox to try and keep that from happening uh, because it's, it shortens the time, shame on us. time yeah. signal. Yeah. Uh, sign well, in, in some cases, we can't locate the owners to serve a summons and complaint or a notice of violation. So it just ties the whole process up. We can't, you know, if we can't give them a notice of violation, we can't serve a summons. So here we are. So, you know, this just, this gives us an avenue to, mm -hmm to hopefully be able to serve the people who are on the property or? Well, thank you for making the extra effort to knock on the door and do a face-to-face -face and a, those courtesy calls. I know that was really important to us that it's not, your first interaction is not this nasty letter that you get in the mail that's a surprise. And, and we definitely wanna make it definitely more business friendly. It sounds like you're, you're aiming for that. Wendy um, and our team, Madam Mayor, are doing a wonderful job in that capacity. Uh, they just recently celebrated one property that uh, a particular CSO officer worked with the homeowner for a little more than three months. Yeah, yeah, uh, just constant working with them, helping steer them, arrange things, communi uh, coordinate uh, dumpster deliveries, and and uh, if you saw the pictures, you'd truly be amazed. Uh, night and day difference. That's cool. And that was just persistence on part of Wendy and her team. So. Councilmember, oh, I'm sorry, Gonzalez, she used to always mention the, or frequently mention the house on 9th and College that's getting painted. And for a while it looked like there was some progress being made. You know, there's activity, but haven't seen anything for a while. I was curious about the status of that one. Um, that one's an ongoing case. Um, we're constantly working that. Um, there's a myriad of issues there. We were out there yesterday. Um, you know, it's it's co-owned um, by two people, and we're working with both individuals. It's just, it's just not an easy one at all. So, um, there's a lot to that one. Okay. <laughs> but we get calls on that one daily. So Do you get them every it's single It's like day? the most visible property in town. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to applaud your effort and uh, let you know how much we appreciate it. Um, probably one thing that I hear most from the public since I've been on council is we need to clean up our city. We need to get the junk picked up. And, and now at least I can tell them we're working on it. We have a fully staffed um, code enforcement department and, and, it, and it's, it's coming. So I really appreciate the work that you guys are doing. Yeah. It's not a, and I appreciate that, thank you. It's not, it's not a fast process. And most people think, you know, we go, we knock on the door and it's gonna be, if you're the neighbor that complained that it'll be cleaned up tomorrow. And it's not a fast process, but um, you know, my officers, we have, my, myself included, we have full, full-time officers. I don't carry the same caseload they do because Chief makes me do so many other things. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> it's because you do them so well. <laughs> but, but they, they work. That bus just went that way. <laughs> <laughs> 
but um, on any day they're working four or five cases at a time each of them so and that's about you know that's about max what they can handle as far as getting those solved and then moving on to the next one if the, if they take on 10 or 12 at a time then you end up with stuff that just doesn't get the follow-through and doesn't get finished so that's kind of it's kind of the caseload we manage well it's unfortunate too that it always seems like there's this nuisance property sandwiched between these two beautiful properties and those neighbors are severely upset all the time and those are the ones that come to us and say we've got to get this cleaned up the ones we actually laugh at are the this this nuisance property gets called in on three times a day but two houses down there's a property six times worse than that one and they'd never get a call <laughs> interesting so so go ahead go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. well i you know i just want to kind of follow up um, because I know that there's been a lot of activity on this on this property on Park Avenue and this has been an ongoing issue for quite a while and, and it is something because one I live I have to drive by it I well I usually don't drive by. I don't drive park very often but um, but I hear this a lot from my neighbors and and that's really where I hear it from is right there and and the people I know on South 12th Street are we gaining anywhere on that property? Because it almost seems like it's starting to get worse again. Yeah. The, um, I don't know that there's anything I can say in a public meeting at this okay. point. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, but uh, the while we have you here, maybe, Wendy, from, from your perspective, you could explain the, the code enforcement process to us. I, I'm not so much interested uh, in, you know, I, I know that we have a code and, and that it is enforced and that involves visits to the property and notices to property owners uh, of, of problems uh, and, and uh, communications about what they can do to solve the problems. But tell us a little bit about the communications you have kind of moving up the ladder so that, so that these problems are shared uh, you know, with your supervisor, with the city uh, the you know so that uh, so that maybe for our new members about how that how that process works and how that kind of brings in checks and balances okay so the the problems um, the cases are identified in a couple of different ways um, we get calls or complaints you know old-fashioned way via telephone from citizens uh, we get co calls and com well complaints on the city's C click fix system um, we get calls that come in through dispatch. Um, those are not as, as common as like the C-click fix or just a regular telephone call. Um, we, we bet those, we go out, we look at the property, just usually just a drive-by um, and verify if it's you know just an angry neighbor or if it's a legitimate, legitimate complaint. And then one of the three officers will take that on as a case. Um, we, have, we have a project management um, software system that it goes in. It, the progress is tracked with notes and you know this was done today this was done tomorrow hey I need help with this that kind of stuff um, we have a weekly meeting my team has a weekly meeting where we sit down and discuss who's working what where they're at if they need anything and then that's followed up with a weekly meeting with our um, commander our um, supervisor and then he reports up to chief um, what we're doing there and then once a month we have a meeting here at City Hall um, with Ryan and Patrick and Kathy um, and we all discuss the issues and if there's a property that maybe City Hall has heard about or knows about that we haven't been told about yet or maybe there's something we need to work with building the building department on so we have that coordination um, effort there as well too. That, that monthly meeting also includes the city prosecutor and the city attorney. Great, great. Uh, thank you for that. that. That's really, I was looking for that because that, I think that puts us all on the same playing field about what's going on here and what, uh, you know, what r really there are a lot of checks and balances in our system and, and it's important to, uh, for, uh, for us and for the public to realize that, that this is not just somebody with a violation pad running out and, you know, writing things willy nilly, but there's, there's a lot of discussion that goes on and consultation uh, uh, to make sure that we're, we're approaching things in the right way. Absolutely. Any other questions or comments from council? Just a really quick one. Um, when you mentioned that it's a long process, I'm gonna even say that it has been a process of several years, even just getting to this point. 
Um, I mean, there was that time, I don't know if you remember, when the weeds at St. Scholastica's before Phil Lent owned it, and they were above, you know, taller than people. The homeless were tearing copper pipes out of the buildings. We also had a, another house that had a huge hole in the roof, and there was an old ratty tart flying on it. And a police officer, you, this is before your time too, a police officer lived next door and he parked his car in front of that house. And the neighbors thought that police officer lived in that house and they <laughs> almost punched him in the face over it. And nothing was being done. I mean, there was nothing being done to address it. And, and it's just kind of taken a long process to get to this point where where people are like, yeah, let's have code enforcement. We, we want it, we need it. I mean, not everybody wants it. <laughs> but, no, it's not something that anybody wants. Um, but, um, <laughs> nobody wants to be told what to do on their the property. And we, we get that a lot. the community as a whole, though, has been really mm -hmm. wanting it. So. so thank you. We really appreciate it. Yes, thank you. We do. Uh, any other questions or comments? Then we're done here tonight. Thank you all. <laughs>